here, first of all. This is a real treat. Hello there. She was enjoying all of the estrogen in the room, I think. I am. <laughs> I'm, I really am. I came in here, just been in the office all day, and I've met all these wonderful women, and the noise level and the warmth is great to be Isn't here. Isn't it great? Yeah, it's great to be here. So um, we always start with what we call the great, the big get to know you at our at our sure. summits. And um, so we're going to do a little get to know you going way back. And okay. you have an interesting um, childhood in that you became this prominent politician, but it's not exactly like you lived a life of privilege. No, I didn't. No. Uh, what was your childhood like? Well, my childhood was a very normal childhood. I've come from Denmark, uh, lived in the suburbs of Copenhagen, the south uh, of Copenhagen, which uh, if you're Danish, it tells you a lot because that's not where the wealthy people live, quite the opposite. Uh, come from a divorced background. Uh, and there was no politicians in, in my family, but I had a very, very strong family. And my father, he always looked at us, my sister and I, he says, you should become prime ministers. He did? Yeah, he did. Why? Because he, he believed that we could be anything. And he said it. He was, uh, he was crazy like that. He, he said was it. just taken by your brains? And no, he, he just, just thought really that thought we should. He, I mean, he, people think it's not true when I say it, but it is actually true. He looked at my sister. She's older than me, so it's more her than me, really. But, uh, <laughs> but nevertheless, I sort of listened in and said, all right, he says we should just become prime ministers. I love that. Yeah, it's quite cool. And so it <laughs> obviously had an impact. And even though you didn't come from, I mean, they were conservative, but they were a hugely political family, no, right? And you're drawn to politics, yeah. which is something is, which it's, I have been around politics for decades, and this is a, 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 something that requires a distinct personality, uh, which somebody who can dive into crowds and you know, shake hands and remember names and it's the retail politics is an art were you it is good at but that? I think this is something that you learn and I think I, this is what I share with a lot of women in in the room that I was always drawn to to make an impact and taking decisions and I started a anti-bullying campaign when I was 12 years old in school. You did? Yeah, but I think I share that with a lot of these women that we try, that you have tried to, to change things from an early age, but I was not a politician from an early age because I was shy. I remember the first time I had to speak to a big audience, this was in university, I had to sort of take the floor and say something amongst other students and I was very scared. I was very scared, I, I can still feel that the heartbeat, and I th I'm sure that a lot of women here have tried that, but the secret is to go on and try it and realize that wasn't that stupid, and uh, do it again, and then you stop being scared. So it's the Nike ad, just do it. Uh, yeah, it is a bit. Yeah. It is a bit, because courage creates courage. And once you've been courageous one and said, I'm just going to do this, even though I'm not quite sure whether it'll be successful, you become more courageous and you do it the next time round. So you and I'm sure that the, the women sitting in this room, they were not always courageous because you're not, no one is. But courage creates more courage to, to go for it next time. To go for it. Yeah. So you served in the European Parliament. I did. And then you became the first uh, female Prime Minister of Denmark. And I have to tell you and, and tell our audience that at this time last year, we were sitting here with the first prime minister, female prime minister of Australia, yeah. Julia Giard. Julia, yeah. And what's so fascinating to me is that you're at the top and you underwent a really grueling public relations yes. uh, episode. Yeah. So Julia went through being called um, a, a campaign to ditch the witch, yeah, and, and which led to her this famed misogyny speech. And if you haven't read it, this takedown of the opposition leader Tony, Tony Abbott on YouTube. I encourage everybody to watch it because it's really wow. The drama in that is amazing. But when you came in, you were Gucci Helle. I was. Which was yeah. basically <laughs> a, a comment on your clothing. Uh, it was so, not so much a comment on my clothing. It, 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 they tried to be, but it was also a way of trying to frame me as not being of the people and not being a social democrat. That's the party I belong to. And it was a, it was a way of trying to distance me from the people that I was wanting to represent. And so how did you deal with that? I don't know how I dealt with it. It just, no, I just started working and doing what I had to do. I became the leader of my party. I was a leader for 10 years, which is a very long time in politics. Then I became prime minister. And I don't think this is what I'm associated with any longer. 
Uh, I just, you just have to work your way out of stuff like that. But a, a, a name like that, whether it was Julia's names or the names that have been uh, connected with me or any other leader, it's always some, someone trying to frame you and put you at a disadvantage. It's never a good thing to be, have a name like that. And how did you keep it from getting under your skin? I think we, when you're doing high politics or any position where you are a little bit on your own, you have, to, and, being, and, are, and if you're being criticized, you have to make a clear distinction between the criticism of your public persona and who you are as a private person. And I always felt that I was, I was okay. I was okay, I was a good enough mom, I was a good enough wife, I was you did, a good enough You did friend. your own laundry, you shoveled, Always, there are photos yeah, of you yeah. shoveling your own snow, yeah, yeah. which I think is yeah. pretty important in politics. That was a crazy yeah. picture. Yeah. But I, I felt that was okay, so I didn't, then you don't let it get into you, right. because they're criticizing your public persona, but I never felt they were criticizing me as a person. Right. And so you I mean, I have been very angry, and I have been sad, and I have been very angry about this, and I have thrown stuff at the TV and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't want to sit here and become like someone who never gets angry, because I have been very angry, but somehow I didn't let it get to me, and that's because I felt I'm okay. You're okay. Yeah. You also, um, you were dealing with a financial crisis. You were yeah. dealing with all these other crises yeah. as well. And you have an interesting um, lineage in that your uh, father-in-law is Neil Kinnock, the yeah. former uh, high-profile, yeah. almost prime minister, labor leader. Um, did he ever give you advice? Well, I've, when I was thinking about standing for leadership, it was a, it was a, it was, there was two people standing, and it was a hard-fought election, a, a campaign to become leader of my party. Uh, and that's the other thing, you should never be afraid of a fight. You should always get into a fight. Um, otherwise, Should you, you be ready for that fight? Always a fight. There should always be ready for a fight. Huh. Because? There's always a fight, and there's always someone who's out to get you. And if you're not, if you're not ready for it, you'll be surprised by it. So it, does that mean you go on offense before you have to go on defense? No, but you're always ready to be in, in a war. Do you like it? Look at her eyes. <laughs> <laughs> if you're in politics and if you are a leader of a party and you're fighting to become prime minister, you always have to ready, be ready to be in a war. And that is in your own party and with other parties and other people and media. You always have to be ready to strike back. And what was a moment where you struck back and surprised people? I think I did that many times. I mean, I've been in hard-fought uh, hard election campaigns where I was being very, I mean, where we were hard on each other, uh, the two people fighting to become prime ministers. I mean, even it's a, though it's a small country, it means a lot in the situation. So I've been in very hard fighting. And I've been hard fighting within my own party. I've had to sack ministers. I have to reshuffle governments. I had to... I had a three-party coalition that turned into two-party coalitions. So I've taken a lot of decisions. I'm not alone in this room having taken a lot of decisions, but if we take decisions that influence other people's lives, you have to be ready to fight. So, and not take it too personal. You also have, you started <laughs> dealing with a divisive issue, which is refugees, yeah. and I think that the next government is really having yeah. to deal with this. And it's interesting because, you know, this government has taken actions like running ads in Arabic newspapers, warning refugees not to come, has given police the right to seize assets. Yeah. And in fact, I think people don't know this, that the liberal, tolerant Denmark actually is not, um, does not have to hew to EU standards on refugees, correct? Uh, we do have to do the, have the same standards as everyone else because we, of course, uh, we are subject to the same conventions and the same legislation as everyone else. But we are not part of the EU uh, uh, re refugee system. It doesn't mean anything because Denmark is still one of the countries taking more, more refugees than so many others. Uh, they were when I was prime minister and they still are. So Denmark is a country that takes a lot of responsibility. So do you think it's pressing the boundaries, the refugee crisis is pressing the boundaries of Denmark's liberal, tolerant um, history? And, and, and talk about it both as a former prime minister but now uh, with Save the Children. I think it's pressing all European countries that they want to control their borders, they want to control who's coming in, but they are pressured from 
refugees coming to their borders. So it's not only Denmark, and Denmark is a great country, and as I said, have taken more responsibilities than many other countries, including the UK, um, and many other countries in, in Europe uh, in terms of how many refugees we've taken per capita. But they're also so saying... It's no, but all countries are doing that. All yeah. countries are doing that, and the only solution that all countries should try and find is a common European solution. I think it's a complete no-brainer that no country can solve this issue on their own, and that's why I'm advocating for common European solutions, because of course European countries can deal with a million refugees if they had to, and if they try to to ha have a bit of a burden sharing, if you want to say it like that, and actually share this situation with each other. Right now, what's happening is that a few countries are taking a lot of refugees. Of course, European countries should work together to share the burden. What do you think? And there is room in Europe for a million people. Uh, there is room in Europe to look, look after a million people. And what we just have to think about all the time is that these people, they're fleeing the most dreadful war we have seen in our neighborhood for many, many countries, and of course there's room. But how do you vet those people? Thank you. Are systems in place to properly vet those people, everybody to protect the security of countries? Uh, I think this How is an issue, and I think this is an issue, and we, we should talk openly about these issues, because I know that government leaders are thinking about these things. They want to open up to refugees, but of course, with a, a dis discussion about security, they have to look into this as well. I think, again, with the right cooperation between European countries, um, with the right sharing of, uh, of the burden, they could actually, they could sort this out. And we have to remember that most of the people coming, I mean, by far the majority, are just normal Syrian people who couldn't be in their country any longer. I've met some of those Syrian refugees. I met them in Jordan. And the only thing they want is to have a normal life. Mm. I met a 15-year-old boy and asked him, as I always do when I meet a, a child, what do you want to do when you grow up? And he was just saying, I want to be a professional football player. Mm -hmm. Because that's what boys say yeah. when you meet them in Europe. So that just, for me, underlines what a normal boy he is. And then he continued and he said, I just want to go to school. I want my father to work. And I want our family to go on trips like we used to do. These are people who knows what normal looks like. These are people who just used to live a normal life in Aleppo and Damascus or wherever they come from. And basically, they want to return to that. And that's what the world should be focused on as well, to try to make that possible. Well, that's what I was going to say. Has enough effort been directed at helping people, creating safe zones to return to, yeah. rather than having to integrate into Europe? Which yeah. They don't want to home. come to Europe. They want a peaceful place to live in their own country. And at the end of the day, after conflict in Syria, if hopefully it ends, don't you need a civil society yeah. there that is embodied in those refugees? Absolutely, that and that's why one of the things that we are campaigning for in Save the Children is that no child should be out of school for more than one month. Okay, good. Why is that? Why is that so important? Is it not more important to have health and food and all those things? That is important as well. But we know that what refugees more, want more than anything is to go to school. And the one thing that makes them be on the move or uh, venture into very dangerous journeys across the Mediterranean is the fact that their children can't go to school. Mm. Why do I say this with such great certainty? Because we have asked them. We have asked 9,000 mm. people living in 17 different settings, what is your main priority? And people who actually do not have the best access to health services, do not have the best access to daily food, they still say, we want education. So that's why I'm so passionate about this, that if we could just make sure that children could go to school, people would not venture into these very dangerous uh, journeys across the Mediterranean, where people die every day. Where would you put this movement of peoples, plural, mm. um, where would you rank that on the list of concerns we need to focus on? Well, I would say that the, the fact that we now have 
more people on the move than we have ever counted since World War II. This is the situation globally. I believe that people being on the move is a defining issue of our time. When we look back at this time 20 years from now, where we're all really old, and we look back, this will be the defining issue, that people were moving. We have 60 million people on the move. You can always make sure, you can always know that when 60 million people are on the move, half of them are children, half of them are children, they are on the move, they don't have a home. They have fled their home, they've left their home, they don't have a home. And when you don't have a home, you don't have any security. And what's worse, of course, is that we have many unaccompanied minors who are the most vulnerable people sure. on this earth. They get abducted, they get sexually abused, they get sold, they get, I mean, they get to work, they get married very early. I mean, there's no stopping evil when you look at what these children are subjected to. I'd like to call for questions. Any questions from the audience? And I'll ask a question to get, oh, right here. Oh, it's a question. Thank you. Hi, Sabah Nazar from Bank of America. I'm married to a Dane, so I know your country well. Um, question for you, if Britain leaves the EU, do you think Denmark will follow? Hmm. Thank you for asking me that question, because I decided not to comment on the Brexit vote. You did? But this is not a comment on the Brexit vote. This is coming on what's, what we're happening in Denmark. Uh, and I think uh, the Danish discussion is, is quite different from the British discussion. And if you ask the Danes whether they want to leave the EU or stay, I think we could get an overwhelming majority to stay. Danes like the EU, they don't like everything about the EU. I mean, they're tired of the EU and we have lost referenda and it's very, things are hard. And everyone knows that the EU is not perfect. But deep down, I think a lot of Danes know how, uh, how much we gain economically, culturally, uh, in terms of our freedom by being part of the EU. And I think we are still in the 60s of a majority of, of staying in the EU. So I know you can't comment exactly on Brexit, but I can, but I choose not but to. But you choose yeah. not to, yeah. or you don't want to, yeah. correct. But you know, one of the things that has fed the um, Leave vote is this sense that, the, that Brussels is this big bureaucracy, bloated bureaucracy with um, lots of people getting paid, a lot, lot of bureaucrats mm -hmm. getting paid a lot of money. And um, the Kinnicks um, and you were part of some negative mm -hmm. press coverage even over the weekend about that. Can you talk about that and, and how much you think that plays into the Brexit debate? Not, not just you guys, no, but, no, the, no, the, but that whole the, sense the general, of the bloated bureaucracy. Sense. I think that plays a role, and I think you should always be in favor of reforming the European Union. And that's why I believe that it's actually quite interesting the way the Brits have started a debate about reforming the European Union. Does it need reform? Yeah, uh, but I think everywhere you are needs reform. I mean, reform is the new normal of right. everywhere. Right. <laughs> so I think everywhere you are needs every day that you ask, are we fulfilling our purpose? Are we servicing the people? Uh, are we doing the, the best we can with the money? Everywhere, me and Save the Children have to ask that question. People here who are, have different positions have to ask that question. But has the question. EU been insulated, too insulated from those questions? I think that EU is, 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 is a, one of the reasons why all of us can sit here peacefully talking to each other, why we have friendship across the European continent, a friendship that we have never, ever had before. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a basic positive. <laughs> but nothing is perfect, and we need a reform of the European Union. And David Cameron had asked for a reform of the European Union. So why would you leave such a debate when you just started it? Okay. <laughs> Question. Right here, back. And I'll get you. <coughs> Mike is coming. And just a reminder to identify yourself. And uh, Linda Lorimer, now executive director of Pearson and day job at Yale University. Thank you for taking on this important role at Save the Children. This is a veritable brain trust, as Patty would say, a community. How can we women help support the noble work of Save the Children? Good question. Oh, that's a great question. That's a great question. And I already had people coming up to say, how can we, uh, we help? I would appreciate anyone here to help. And I think it is such an important course. And I know that I share that with, with many of you. 
as I was saying, children are the most vulnerable in conflict. Whatever happens, children are vulnerable. I'll tell you a story. If there is sometimes a, a natural disaster, an earthquake, something that happens, say the children is in a rush to get to that place before traffic, people who traffic in children get there. Oh, that's what they do. They, they wait yeah. for crises and they go if in. If there's a crisis, we are in a rush to wow. get there before other people get there because we will try to help. They will try to do the opposite. And that's just an example. I was actually... I you was know, no one's framed that that way. I think that's a really important moment that when there is... Yeah, a, a crisis. If there's an earthquake, a nat in natural disaster, like that, that these guys they come, they, they come in because this is how they can make money. And I didn't understand that until someone told me. I said, mm. "Of course." And I'm just giving that as an example of how why I think it is needed that we have fast-moving, agile organizations that can go in and help children. How can you help? Well, you can give your card to me, <laughs> all of you, or She's you can. She's at table five. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Or you, can, or you can actually contact the, your local uh, Save the Children. We have um, almost 30 member organizations. But are there, uh, are there roles for the, the private sector that you we, see? We have a lot of cooperation with the private sector. We couldn't do what we do without the private sector. Uh, I will try to promote that even more. But I mean, I can't take credit for this because we have some solid long-term relationship with some of the best corp uh, corporate uh, co companies in the world. We are very proud of that. And I just want to say to anyone who's interested, if you are interested, come to us, because we are very experienced in working with our corporate partners, and their, their support is invaluable. And we do it in all kinds of ways. We have secondments into our organization, secondments to the other organization. We work together in, in many, many ways. Uh, that for hopefully are useful uh, to, the, to the corporate partners that we work with. And I would add that and corporate... And we respect that enormously. And corporate partners come up with often very innovative ideas. In That's what it's all about. Situations. For us, it's all about being agile and trying to innovate what we do, trying to innovate and then scale up. And this, if there's something that our corporate partners knows about, it is just that. And that's why we're so happy and proud to work with corporate partners. We have a question right here. Mike, quickly. Quickly. <laughs> Firstly, thank you very much for a really inspirational um, talk. Um, and could you identify yourself? Yes, yeah, sorry. I'm, I'm Leslie Ann Nash. I'm a director in the UK Cabinet Office, um, advising our Prime Minister on a number of things. And I. I have a working class background as well, and sorry not to talk about Brexit. I could talk about Brexit all day long, as you can imagine, but I Come won't. Come tomorrow morning, we'll have a panel. Yeah. So I want, I want to bring it back down to you, if I may. Um, with a working class background myself, I wonder if you ever suffer from imposter syndrome. Hmm. Another good question. I wouldn't say I have a working class background. My mum was, uh, she, she worked herself up in the company. I don't have a working class background. My, my father was a, was a teacher, so I don't have a working class background. Uh, I have a, come from a background with a lot of education and a lot of uh, cultural interests. I, don't, I never thought of myself as a, with a working class background, so I can't claim that, and I won't claim that. Um, but I, I remember when I went to university, and I had to take my friends home. There. I stayed with my mum back then. I had to take my ho friends home, and they thought, felt that they were on a social safari. <laughs> which we often laughed at since, uh, but it was actually a great moment for me because I realized that I could bring something into their world that they didn't know about. They simply had not been in a small flat in the town where I come from, um, which is the place where you have most immigration. Back then you had lots of crime. You don't have that so much anymore. So it was interesting to bring that knowledge into their, their world, and I felt that I could enrich them rather than I was an imposter. Okay, so we have um, time. I'm going to end on a, a light note. Um, you, you shot to world fame with a selfie uh, with David Cameron and uh, Barack Obama. Quickly describe the fallout to that. It was such an amazing day. It really was. I, I kept debating myself whether it was a good thing or a bad thing, but I think because it made me so famous, <laughs> I tend to think it was a good thing. It's like, and run it, with it. If they spell my name right, go for it. Exactly. Right? <laughs> exactly. Um, no, it was just an amazing day. It was, uh, it was, I wouldn't call it a funeral. It was a memorial day for uh, Nelson right. Mandela. 
uh, we were all there in a big stadium. This is South Africa. Everyone was like shouting and they were booing. And it was like a big, there was a very bit of a, uh, of a happy atmosphere. And the funny thing is when we came to the stadium, sitting down, there was no seating. So I just sat down. I was just sitting down. And I, there was two seats next to me that were reserved, but no one was sitting there. <laughs> so I was just like, this is good seats. And then, <laughs> but they were, they were reserved for someone else, and I didn't know who it was. It turned out it was uh, Barack and Michelle. <laughs> Um, so I got sitting next to them, which was called Cool. I met, uh, met uh, Barack many times before that, and we were just chatting. We were all three talking about our children, and you know how you just talk about normal things. And then people start coming over to take pictures, not with me, but with Obama. <laughs> so everyone kept, came over, and there was a bit of a jolly atmosphere. Then Cameron came over to sit, and he sort of sat on the other side of me, and uh, we were just having a, a chat. And it was, that was a, a jolly atmosphere. And then I said, well, just, and I had never taken a selfie before at that stage. This so was, was your my first, first selfie. Ever selfie. Who and I had just, I had just learned this from my teenage daughters. <laughs> so they had taught me how to take selfies. They hadn't really taught me because it's quite crap, the picture, actually. Um, <laughs> so I said, we're going to have a selfie. And they were like, yes, great. <laughs> <laughs> so we took the selfie, and the funny thing, I think the three of us had all, we had actually forgotten in the moment that it wouldn't be our little selfie moment, the oh, three right. of us. <laughs> that it might go virtual. Yeah. <laughs> because then I met Barack Obama some months later, and he said, you got me into trouble, so I think he had not thought of it either. <laughs> Um, and by the way, it wasn't with Michelle because she's just lovely and there was nothing about that. Uh, uh, so that was the story of the selfie. It was actually quite an innocent, just a spur of the moment, let's just take a picture like you do when you sit with people. And it took over the world. It took well, over the world. Well, on that note, we're going to start... But it made me a complete selfie queen. And that means every time I meet people, I take loads of selfies. And I do, I do that in the Denmark. The selfie queen. Yeah. yeah. Well, so, Selfie Queen, we're going to end on that note and have dinner. Thank yes, you all. Thank you very much.